Yeah, a generalist, and I mean that in the best sense of the word. This is uh, Steve Benson, who's one of my colleagues at uh, Dartmouth. And uh, Steve, every medical school has that really cool professor who everyone wants to be. And uh, I imagine Michelle is like that at, uh, at, in Mayo, Jacksonville. And, and I will tell you that Steve Benson is the guy at Dartmouth. So any medical school for the last, any student from Dartmouth in the last 20 years who's been through Dartmouth will say, Steve Benson is, is the absolute guy. And from a GI perspective, he does everything from ERCPs to complex IBD. He's the head of our teaching uh, service at, uh, at Dartmouth. And he's just an all around incredibly awesome guy. And uh, this is just one of the many things that he does. So Steve, one of my great mentors, uh, thanks for coming. Well, th thank you very much, Tim. And thank you for having me here today. It's an honor to be here and talk about a little bit something different. I think I'd put this more in the physician wellness and motivation uh, portion of the of the conference. And I'm gonna, the objectives are listed here. I'm really gonna just describe a, health, a healthcare system in an under-resourced setting. I'm gonna talk about the advantages on both sides in partnering and getting into uh, global health. I'm gonna define the role of gastroenterology in, under, in an under-resourced setting. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the kind of ethical things that can come up when you get into this type of work. Um, this is the country we're focusing on is Rwanda. And I first met a, a young gastroenterologist there, the only gastroenterologist in the country, a guy named Tim Walker from Australia. And uh, he was a mentor to me when I got there. He spent about seven years in Rwanda. And he had this quote when he came to talk at Dartmouth. He said, Rwanda is beautiful, but beauty belies the fact that life is hard and being sick in Rwanda is very hard. It's a spectacularly beautiful country. It's called the land of a thousand hills um, and a beautiful climate. People ask me how I got involved in global health. I was not trained in tropical medicine. Um, and this is my daughter who spent five years in Togo, West Africa, uh, working for an NGO there. And people say, you must be so proud because you do work in Rwanda and she does this in Togo. But it's actually completely opposite. And it's the generation of, of the fellows here that's pushing us, I think. And I, I had her meet with the Dean of Global Health at Dartmouth, who is a colleague of mine from medical school, Lisa Adams. And she counseled, she was very generous in her time in counseling Emily in her career in global health. And she was kind of whispering in Emily's ear, you know, I'm starting this program at Dartmouth called HRH, and we're going to bring faculty, recruit faculty to go to Rwanda for extended stays. And I think it'd be good for your dad to do it. So the two of them kind of conspired to, to you know, get me involved to do it. So it really was her that brought me into it rather than me influencing her. So just a little bit on Rwanda. It's a tiny country the size of New Hampshire, deep in the, just in the heart of, of the continent of Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's bordered by the Congo to the north, and uh, Tanzania to the east, and then Burundi to the south, and Uganda to the north. Um, population, although it's small, the population is about 12 and a half million, so it's probably the most, one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Um, the language is Kin Rwandan. Many people, everyone speaks Kin Rwandan, and they say the, 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 the colonial language is English, which, which is really not true. It's a Belgian colony, so the, the colonial language is um, French, but in 2009, Kagame, the leader, said, today we're English. So that's great, because then it, it opens it to the West, so we can have programs, a lot of NGOs moved in, but from a practical standpoint, uh, none of the patients speak English, the poor, uh, none of the nurses speak English, they all speak French and Kin Rwandan, and some of the doctors can speak a little bit of English, and the younger you are, the better your, your English is. Um, when you hear of Rwanda, what, what comes to mind? What, what, like, what immediately jumps to mind about Rwanda? As opposed to the genocide, exactly. So. Um, in 1994, uh, militant, there are two ethnic groups, Tutsis and, and Hutu. Militant Hutu militias started slaughtering their neighbors, uh, Tutsis. And they had lived in harmony for, for years. Um, and there were 800,000 people killed in 100 days. And that, that's the story. And uh, a, a rebel leader, Tutsi leader in uh, hiding out in Uganda, Kagame, came and saved the day and stop the, stop the genocide. That's sort of the party story. He's still in power now. The real story is, is being unfolding. Kagame went on to kill at least a half a million um, Hutus in revenge, and some of them not genocide or some of them just regular villagers and things. So the story is still being written. But nobody can, uh, you can't think about uh, Rwanda without knowing about the genocide. And it's touched everybody, everybody's life. So everyone you meet has been affected deeply by the genocide. And these are some or orphans from the genocide. And this would be about the age of the young doctors and students that were teaching this is the age that they would have been uh, during the genocide. Um, so 
As a result of the genocide, Rwanda, in the years immediately leading up to it and probably for five years afterwards, it was the worst place in the world to live by any health metric, whether maternal and child health metrics or life expectancy. It was the worst place in the world to live with a life expectancy of 45 years. But then an amazing thing over the next 15 years is they improved the life expectancy up to, two, up to 66, which is comparable to other sub-Saharan African countries. How they do that, well, they did it by building a rich, uh, health force of community health care workers. These are women, always usually women, from the local village with, with low levels of education. They train them to treat the basic things, malaria, diarrhea, they equip them to do that, give out malaria nets, basic uh, prenatal care. So they're able really to do the low-hanging fruit and, and improve lives. And you can see in the, in the bottom corner there, getting people on HIV drugs was huge. So the death rates from AIDS went way, way down by making everyone have uh, a, a antiretrovirals available to them. So that's where they were in 2011, and this is what the health uh, force looked like. All of, the, uh, all of the focus was in the bottom. They, there was um, uh, about 15,000 communities that they broke them down to, staffed by 45,000 community health care workers. And if you were too sick for them to deal with, you went to a health center, which was staffed by a low-level trained nurse. And if you're too sick for that, you might move to the district hospital if you're lucky to move there. And that was staffed by a workforce of about 475 physicians who were generalists, meaning they had six years of medical school after high school and then one year of a general practice uh, training. And then th that was their level of training. Many of these were doctors. Many doctors were slaughtered during the genocide. So these were often doctors from the Congo. So generalist physicians in the district hospital, so 475 for 12 million people. And then there are about 150 specialists at the four district referral or the four referral, referral hospitals. And by specialists, I don't mean pancreatologists or gastroenterologists. We mean internists or pediatricians or general surgeons. So no, literally no subspecialists in the country. So the problem is focusing up here. Um, how can we improve things? How can we train a healthcare force? How can we get more doctors? Um, and they was well below the levels that are recommended by the World Health Organization. So. The problem was there's a critical shortage of healthcare workers, doctors, and trained nurses. How do we train this workforce um, with the limited people that were there? And the concept that came up with, and it was a novel one, it was a program called Human Resources for Health. And we, it was a consortium of about uh, 12 academic institutions that would commit to sending four to five, and we ended up sending six or seven a year, faculty to Rwanda for extended stays from anywhere from three months up to a year. So a significant uh, commitment. Where did the money come from? It was money that was already going to Rwanda in terms of the PEPFAR money, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, Malaria Fund money that was already going to Rwanda. It was redirected to this program. So then the uh, Clinton Health Access Initiative was involved in setting things up. It was supposed to be a seven-year program. It's, it's tailing off now. It's been approved for another three years to keep it going at a lower level. And we had uh, ambitious uh, goals. These were the academic institutions involved, Harvard, uh, Virginia, Yale. Um, and we had goals to increase the, uh, the targets here to go from 625 up to uh, that number of 1,000, over 1,000 physicians, but it drastically increased the number of specialists trained. And this was an article that was published in New England Journal by the Minister of Health and others. Um, I'm going to go on. What did we do? Well, we basically just set up residency training programs in the six basic specialties, internal medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, anesthesia. And here we are doing morning rounds, setting up uh, morning conferences and teaching, developing the curricula. Another concept was that of twinning. So we were gonna be paired with a colleague and, and kind of mentor them along. And that worked in some cases and not in others. And these are the two, uh, my two twins or pairs is Benoit and Vincent. And well, I was supposed to mentor them along. But what I found was that I learned much, much more from my twin, particularly Vincent, than that I could ever teach him. He was a man who had received his training in, in uh, Minsk in Russia and came back in December of 1993 right before the genocide, and he ended up, and he's Hutu, he ended up fleeing, and his family, his wife and, and young daughter, which remained in, in Russia for several years while things were unfolding, and he was a, one of five physicians in a refugee camp of 200,000 people, so he, he had a lot of life lessons to teach me, and I learned, as I say, more from him than, uh, than I could ever teach him. 
Uh, and here he is teaching. So how did we do? What me well, this is, this is the results. We trained, there were, um, we have now 185 medical students graduating in 2019. We're in 2000, there were just nine in each class. We have 1,500 doctors, and as of 2019, we'll have about 80 intern internists trained um, uh, through the program. And uh, this just shows the cumulative number of residents coming, um, coming out through the program. So we have 85 internal medicine trained residents now, so internists, and then we've recruited 60 to stay on as teaching faculty. And that's kind of a tension that we have in the Ministry of Health. When the, our smartest, best internists come out, they often get pulled to the remote district hospitals, and we like to keep them at the academic institutions. I personally had to intervene a few times in the Ministry of Health and keep the real smart ones at the teaching institutions so they can be junior faculty and, and continue the, the training program on. Um, and this just puts a face on the first graduating class that came through the program. And all of these doctors, some are in district hospitals, but the majority of them are now the leaders and the heads of, of internal medicine in their respective district, ho in their respective teaching hospitals. So what's it like um, working there? This is me and Tim Walker, I think it was my first day rounding. There's a patient, she's an extremist, she's hypotensive. She's got elevated JVP. She's got muffled heart sounds. So Tim, the, the gastroenterologist, brings over quick, brings over an ultrasound, and I'm, he goes, what do you think, Steve? I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't do echocardiogram. But I think you guys in the front row can see right here. There's two ventricles, and there's that boomerang there. So she's in severe tamponade. So he just pulls out a needle, and there's Jean-Pierre, and he does a bed, bedside pericardiocentesis. So that's the type of thing you see at the, at the, um, at the referral hospital. Uh, we're, we're gastroenterologists. What do you see here? What do you think on the, the, first, the first belly? Somebody's massively distended with ascites. So in our setting, it's probably end-stage liver disease, or it could be uh, uh, carcinomatosis. But in their setting, it could be all of those things, but also could be tuberculosis, or it could be severe heart failure from rheumatic heart disease. What about the one in the middle? What do you think, what do you think of that? We teach our, our medical students, the first thing in physical exam is observation, right? So what do you observe? What do you see on the, on the one in the middle? It's a big, it's a big belly, a little asymmetric. Well, that's, if you look, it's, it's bulging to the left, so that's actually a spleen. So you know how we talk about you want to examine the spleen and start the iliac crest because sometimes the spleen can go all the way down there? Well, this is a case of tropical hypersplenism, which is actually quite common. It's probably a result of recurrent malarial infections. We, we really don't know for sure, but that's a classic case. And then what about the one on the right there? That's the, that's the guy, actually, his chief complaint in the outpatient clinic was of varicose veins. But he has, that's the best, best caput I've ever seen. And I said, how long have you had that? He's had it for years. So we worked him up with a CT and actually has an occluded portal vein that he probably got from infection. So he had his synthetic function of the liver is fine. So these are some of the things that you can see. Um, and you know, the, if we learn the physical exam, but you know, all those things that you're looking for, they're all, they're all actually true. Everything you read in the textbook is true. We just don't see it here because we don't have such advanced disease. So here we're teaching the fluid wave uh, to some medical students. Here's a chest x-ray you might see on morning report. Um, it's the same, it's different patient, but the same disease. Any ideas? Yeah, it's very good, it's POTS disease. So I'm there in like one of the first weeks. Or so doctor, the big debate was how long do we treat for POTS disease? This was somebody who came in with, with back pain for, for weeks and years even, then was, has been paralyzed for a number of months. And the big debate was how long do you treat POTS disease? And I, what do you do at your hospital, Dr. Benson? I'm, so, I'm sorry, we haven't had POTS disease in many years. Um, what about GI? Um, here, two cases of esophageal varices, and that's something that we can work on treating, the varices. The one on the left with the, you know where all your old t-shirts go? They all end up in, in sub-Saharan Africa. She's, she's, she's actually quite healthy. She's got her powerlifting shirt on, and she's, since she was a, an eight or nine-year-old, she kept coming in with variceal bleeding. She'd bleed, hemorrhage, bleed down to hemoglobin of three, and then gradually her hemoglobin went back up again. The other one on the bottom, she has varices, but she's quite sick because she has ascites too, and she has hepatitis C. It turns out hepatitis C occurs in anywhere, we don't know exactly, but somewhere between two to 5% of the population has hepatitis C. Why? It's not, they don't use drugs. It's not blood transfusion. It's not who we get. It, it could be something along those lines that we have different ideas, but I think if you look at her belly, a lot of them have, a, she has scars and there's the, 
in, the, in the healthcare pathway I gave you, I didn't put in that usually when you're sick, they'll go to the traditional healer. So there's a lot of scarification and there's only one person who does. I think there's a lot of hepatitis C is transmitted that way, but it could also be sterilization and things. So the one on the top who's healthy, who keeps bleeding, what's her diagnosis? Well, we see a lot of it and we assume it's non serotic portal hypertension from a recurrent um, schistosomiasis, and that's probably her condition. So pretty neat stuff I mean, for, for a learner to see and exciting about medicine. So I came home and I'm like, I got to bring my, some of my students and residents back. They're going to just flip out. This is great, great uh, learning experience. We did that and I brought some students back. But then one of the ethical things to bring up, but that is a bit of a burden on, on their system for me to have my student or students and learners go there. So the Dean of, of, of Global Health, Lisa Adams, really strove home the concept of reciprocity. So if we're going to bring our learners and trainees there, we need to bring Rwandans to our institution. So we committed to that. And uh, as of date, we've had about 15 Rwandans come to Dartmouth for extended stays for anywhere from two to three months. Here's uh, uh, Menelas is a wonderful teacher. He's the head of the emergency room at Sayasha Canal, which is like the Bellevue of Rwanda. And Eric, they're sitting in my office, and he's going to be our uh, head of GI in, this, in the, uh, in the um, with our fellowship. And here's uh, we get them engaged in the community. We make them do sports, so they're running in our local uh, 5K to support the hospital, and they're on the GI Runs uh, team. And that's Kelly Kiefer, who spent a year in Rwanda as a faculty. Um, so. A lot of infectious diseases, but one, one concept that's growing is that the, the bulk of what we call non-communicable death deaths actually occur in under-resourced countries and settings. So heart disease, liver disease, gastrointestinal conditions, uh, cancers really aren't going, treated, are going untreated in a place like Rwanda. Um, how about GI? Well, uh, the role of endoscopy, there are a few, and I came a few handful, five or six, uh, maybe seven internists who are doing endoscopy with some rudimentary uh, uh, equipment. Here's uh, Vincent in the bottom training uh, a, a, G a young woman GP from the Congo with uh, an old fiber optic scope they had in this remote district hospital in Ruangari. And it's up, they have these beautiful 15,000 foot volcanoes and that's where the mountain gorillas are. So you can see that was the view from the, the, the room we were doing the endoscopies in. And there in the bottom is one of my fellow Zilla who's doing a very complicated procedure training them in something called colonoscopy and they're very excited to learn colonoscopy so she's training them up in a colonoscopy and drawing a crowd um, but there is a big need for advancing GI there's 12 million people like I said there's one gastroenterologist who's not really academic who is trained in uh, Belgium and these in internists who are, are cranking out now they're hungry for further education they're hungry they're desperate for cardiology training and GI training so really with the burden of disease with the hunger for more knowledge really what we need to do is create a GI fellowship program there and, and that would be the first subspecialty program in Rwanda and it would be I think the second uh, uh, gastroenterology fellowship in sub-Saharan Africa there's one in South Africa and there may be one in Ethiopia I'm not I'm not sure it's still running um, so there's a need to develop a, a GI fellowship program and to advance that we did something called we, we formed something called the Rwanda Society of Endoscopy and that was to enable us to send some of our trainees off to sites in Africa Malaysia Sudan Morocco where they had a world gastroenterologic organization training sites so we formed the Rwanda Society of Endoscopy and that was great and we had a few people go but then I said to Vince you know we started this society we should do something with with it he goes you're right he goes we're gonna have endoscopy week I said Great, what's that? He goes, well, you get a bunch of doctors and nurses come over here with parapentines and we'll go advance endoscopy for a week or two. I'm like, okay, brilliant. So that's what we did. We formed the uh, endoscopy week and we've done it for a couple of years now. Here's our, here's our endoscopy uh, uh, team getting picked up in the Hilux pickup truck at the airport heading out. And we've had a bunch go now. There's uh, Christina is our, our fellow, uh, where is she, Christina? Yeah. Do you want to say how we got you to Dartmouth? Um, so I've been involved in global health most of my medical career so far. It's been a real highlight for me. And I was going around to GI fellowship saying, oh, I want to do GI global health. And everyone's like, okay, that's nice. You can try to do that here if you want. And then I went to interview. I was sitting in Steve's room and it was like that picture you saw. He had two Rwandan guys in the room with me during my interview. And he said to them, hey, look at this. Like, look at her, her resume here. She's done a bunch of stuff in Uganda. Do you want her to come and visit you in Rwanda? And they were like, yes, yes, send her to us. And so actually right after my interview, a couple of weeks later, I was going to Uganda. And so Steve fixed it all up. I was still an internal medicine resident. And he, he set me up with, these, uh, with this team in GI in Rwanda and I went there for a week before I went to 
Uganda and I was having such a great time. They were doing this exciting project, getting ready to start this fellowship. And I, I texted him from Rwanda and I said, I want to come to Dartmouth. Like, that's where I want to do my fellowship. I want to do this with you. And that's, that's how they recruited me. <laughs> so uh, it's, it, it has been a good recruiting uh, tool for, for us to have a program to send our fellows. We sent, I've had five GI fellows go so far and, and three from Dartmouth have come. There are some ethical concepts that we have to be in, uh, wary of when we, when we engage, engage in this type of thing. Um, and, and we tried to highlight those in our endoscopy week. One was, I was it was a collaborative effort. So we're working with the teams of Rwanda. This really was their idea. We're supporting them on it. We're providing service. We're helping work down the backlog of patients who need consultation, but also need to have in procedures done. We're training up endoscopists there, and people who've never done them before, and we're also advancing the, 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 uh, the endoscopy techniques in, in physicians who have already been able to do predominantly diagnostic procedures. And then we're also increasing the awareness of GI disease to try and eventually get a GI fellowship program. So this is what it looks like. There's Vincent, he's the guy in charge. Actually, I got him a $10,000 ASG Don Wilson Award to come and work with me for three months at Dartmouth, which is great. So he's wearing his Dartmouth, so he's off to play soccer after this. He's in his Dartmouth soccer shorts, his Danowitz t-shirt. He loved, that's our local country store in Norwich, Vermont. And their motto is, if we don't have it, you don't need it. And that's his, that's, he, he thought that was great. And he's got his, his Century Ride hat on. And in the top corner, that's my office, what it looks like. It's basically a warehouse and people send me stuff from all over when they hear, and you guys hopefully send me some stuff. If you have an old scope laying around that's not going to be used, we could use it to bring to Rwanda. So there, we bring a lot of equipment over with us, and then we spread out literally across the country. We have teams. We go to two in Kigali, one up north to Gisendi, and then one down to uh, Batari. Next year, we'll expand it further. Um, this is what it looks like. This is the Gisendi District Hospital. Some Belgian doctors had donated equipment, an old Fujinon system up there was just sitting in a room. No one was using it because no one was trained to do it. So Andy Robinson down here is one of my, uh, he was a local private practice guy. He heard me talk about it, wanted, he wanted to go, and he wanted to go to the remote, the, he wanted to go to the most remote place. So I sent him up there, and here he is training Shikama, who's been to Dartmouth uh, in Upper Endoscopy. Now Shikama is going up there, and another internist, and they're doing the endoscopies in this district hospital where there was equipment, but, but no one was able Able to do it before. Sedation, that's Rwandan sedation, a lot of hand holding, there's no conscious sedation in most places. Um, and deep friendships are born. So this is uh, Lola. She was one of our techs, is now in PA school, and she worked very, very hard for the whole week, long hours with the, uh, with the, and the Rwandan nurse. Um, and then this is uh, Barnabé, he's in the military. He came to Dartmouth too. He's already doing upper endoscopy and he's already doing colonoscopy. So I'm training him and, and we're putting some bands on and we put in some esophageal stents. So people already doing endoscopy were advancing their, uh, their level of, of training. We also do the GI core curriculum over there for the internal medicine residents. And one of the concepts we brought to them is that of the flipped classroom. They're very, very you know, used to the, the organized um, lectures like we're having today. But this, we're playing GI Jeopardy, uh, GI Bleeding Jeopardy, so, and they loved it. They don't know what Jeopardy is, but they loved the idea of having this game where they were competing teams. So here they were all huddled up and they're arguing about the question. So now every lecture had to be put into the Jeopardy format, so there's no more lectures. So we do that when we're there. Um, and this was our team. We did, you know, 250 procedures, 50 physicians were involved in a team of 12. That was our first year. Well, this is a pancreatic or pancreas uh, um, uh, uh, conference. Is there pancreatic biliary disease? Yes, there is. I've seen a smattering of it. Here's a stone case. Um, but I, there isn't really good epidemiology of what pancreatic or biliary diseases are out there. We don't, there are no studies. I called, I emailed Tim Walker, the guy who had been there for seven years, said, Tim, I got to give this talk to the pancreas people. What, what's your experience? What, what data do we have? And uh, basically, he's seen cholangitis, biliary ascaris, um, pancreatitis, they see it. It's not that common. They presume it's from alcohol, but there are maybe hypertriglyceride, maybe you know, in her hereditary, um, some Caroli's disease, and some strictures, probably from uh, ascaris. I'm winding up. One of the guys on our team, Ben, he's the guy, he's a biomedical engineer. He fixes all the equipment that I bring up and gets it ready to go. And I said, Ben, you should come. You should come sometimes. Like two weeks before we were going to go, he said, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming with you. Great. Well, that guy was the MVP because he was over there fixing ventilators, incubators, things that could be fixed, he was fixing. So he was, ended up being the most valuable member of our team. And I said, um, I was thinking about it, and I asked one of the, one of the uh, uh, Jenny Flaherty, who, an, an anesthesiologist who'd been there for a year, I said, do you remember, is there a C-arm in the operative theater? She goes, yeah, there is, and the, the uh, ortho guy uses it. Because like somebody donated a couple of ERCP scopes. I said, well, we can't use those because we don't do ERCP. And I thought about it, well, 
they have a C-arm, well, maybe we can push things a little bit. So I, I said to Vincent, I go, maybe we should do some ERCPs. to be the first ever in Rwanda, maybe the first ever in East Africa. So we brought um, Stu Gordon, who's Tim's mentor, and our advanced team with us, and there's the first cannulation of a bile duct uh, in Rwanda um, and in East Africa. Here's the case, Stuart in the operative theater, Stuart drawing a crowd in the operative theater. <laughs> Um, we, Vincent's a great promoter, so we were on the news, the first ERCP, it was great. Um, we did have, this is what we found, some, some stones, we had a colidocal fistula, you know, for untreated gallstone disease. He had a cholangiac carcinoma, we did have one complication, which we wouldn't typically see here, and that's a, an ethical lesson for us, too, to be careful, because they're more malnourished and things can happen, adverse events can happen probably more readily in this context. So here, we had a perforation on a stent he was putting in, but the, the amazing thing was the surgeon, whose case it was, just quickly opened the patient in the operative theater, and, and it shows how we really truly work as a team. A Burundian-trained um, Rwandan did, a, did a, a common bile duct resection and hepatic ostomy on this patient with, with a, a biopsy proven cholangiac carcinoma and the guy, the guy survived, or at least we saw him the next day. This is our second time going. I published an article in the ACG magazine. Now our team grew to 22. We had two-day academic conference. We did a conscious sedation course and we started doing some sedated procedures the second time. And then we went back there, and the most amazing thing was that guy who he perforated, the, the doctor said, you know, he's doing well. I'm like, no, no, I, I, it's no way. He had cholangiac carcinoma, packages, there's no way the guy lives. So I said, I got to see him. So he brought him up. He's in pink because he's a, he's a prisoner. He's probably an old a genocide air uh, person. Anyway, there, I'm doubting Thomas. I got to put my finger in the wound, and there it is. So he actually lived, and it was doing, was doing pretty well. And he, he had positive margins, so he won't do well forever, but he got, he got through that. Um, so... These are some examples of what we've done with our work uh, with hepatitis B programs in C. We we're able to get Sofosfavir for the country, um, the first ERCPs. One of the people of our team uh, bought a fiber scanner for the country, so we're starting to do fiber scanning. And that'll be helpful because when we have patients to treat hepatitis C, we can't, we can't treat everybody, but maybe we can use that to identify people more at risk so we can triage who's going to get treated. Treated. I'm finishing up. And then we have the GI Fellowship Program, and we are just about there. We're doing training already, but um, this week we're, we're meeting with the, um, with the Ministry of Health and the powers that be to hopefully get it approved and get support funding for it. So I'm going to wrap up and conclude that um, it's meaningful to transfer knowledge and techniques, and this is an example of us doing that. This is Vincent. He was excited after I completed uh, his time with us. He sent me this picture back of a, of a nail he removed from the duodenum of this young two-year-old. And um, it's an example of we gave him the, the technique to do it. He could do a diagnostic endoscopy. Now we could do therapeutics, and we gave him the tools. We gave him, in this case, a snare, poly, uh, polypectomy snare to remove it. So transfer of knowledge, transfer of skills. Um, but there's more to it than that, okay? We all find fulfillment and reward out of doing this. And my team that's been there, the fellows, everyone has had an amazing experience. They all want to go back. And this is just Kristen, who's probably never been out of the U.S. before, the one in the middle there. And it was really changed her life. And now she's constantly st stealing me, like, things when they're just about outdated, uh, esophageal stents, things like that, variceal band ligators to try and build our, our equipment up for the next year's trip. Um, and then the last point is relationships that we've formed and how important that is. And this is Jean-Pierre. He's the one who did the pericardial synthesis. This is him in 2012 in my house. He was the first Rwandan to come. And then this is me in, in his house, in his home. And it's, it's a, a personal level, the, 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 uh, the relationships we've made, but it's also an institutional one. So Dartmouth now had 32 faculty go to Dartmouth, and I can't keep track of how many students and residents and things we've sent. And it's been a rewarding experience on the Rwandan end, but certainly on our end. So that's where I'll conclude. And then with just the proverb, and I see that in your, in your group here with the pancreas group, if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go together. So thanks for having me.